So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the new seminar of the SCOP virtual lecture series on recent advances of single cell omics. It's a pleasure for me today to welcome Julio Saez Rodriguez. Uh, Julio is both a full professor of medical bioinformatics and data analysis. He's also the director of the Institute for Computational Biomedicine at the Faculty of Medicine at Heidelberg University. He's also a group leader on Molecular Medicine Partnership Unit between Heidelberg University Hospital and EMBL. And finally, he's also a director of the Dream Challenges. Um, Julio will talk today about um, extracting mechanistic insight from single cell and spatial transcriptomics. And before we um, start the talk, I wanted to remind you that the next talk will take place in two weeks on Friday, 17th of July at 10 a.m. by John Marioni. And yeah, finally, before uh, Julio starts the talk, please, if you have questions, you can use the, the raise hand option on the GoToWebinar. And you can also um, write questions on the, there is a question tab that you can use for writing questions. So Julio, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? And do you yes. see my slide? Maria? Yes. Yeah? Yes, I can see the slides. Great. I just don't know how to mute myself, how to take my... Ah, there we go. Okay. Good. Yeah, thanks so much, Maria, for the kind introduction. And thank uh, you and Fabian and Marco and everyone else, uh, Maria and Nina, and the team, for organizing this great uh, event, which is, I think, a wonderful way to stay in touch by the difficult times. Uh, and so today I would like to share with you some of our recent and ongoing work analyzing single cell and also special transcriptomic data to try to extract a mechanistic insight. So in our group, so we are a computational group and broadly speaking, we try to use different types of omics data to understand better human disease with the ultimate aim to to find the better therapies for patients uh, for personalized medicine. And, and we do this across different areas. We have worked largely on cancer in the past, also autoimmune diseases, and more recently in cardiovascular and, and nephrology area. And, and our, our broader strategy is to try to use um, different machine learning and statistical approaches for this end, but we put a lot of emphasis in how we can use biological knowledge to help us in this task. So how can we support algorithms uh, using what we know about the underlying molecular processes. And the idea, generally speaking, is if we have different omics data, and of course, uh, I will discuss this in the context of single cell data, uh, we will try to extract signatures that, as you will see, could be, for example, the activity of a pathway. And these signatures is then what we can input to our algorithms. Uh, and, and the idea is that we have a twofold benefit. So on one hand, because we're going to look at the number of signatures, which is much lower than the number of actual molecules, let's say of genes, we can increase our statistical power. But also these signatures are really rooted on molecular processes that we can then understand, interpret, so we can improve what uh, interpretability of our uh, um, results uh, concerns. And also they are more amenable for validation or, or follow-up studies. So the first thing that we need to do this type of strategy is access to a lot of biological knowledge. And for this, we developed this resource called Omnipath that is really just a one-stop shop to give you access to many resources with the idea that, like if you were to go to, to check new glasses, you can try different lenses until you find the right lens. Through Omnipath, you can try different resources alone or in combination to answer a particular question that you're interested in. And um, so Omnipath, also with Omnipath, we develop a number of benchmarks that we make available and also can be done for part of the benchmarking. And it's a resource that is available either uh, as a bioconductor package, as a Python package, or also as a Cytoscape plugin. So Omnipath includes over 100 different resources, uh, over 2 million annotations for over 20,000 proteins and 16,000 complexes. And as you can see in this figure, it covers really different type of things. So we did start uh, looking at pathways and protein interactions, but we have expanded to different things such as a transcriptional regulation or 3D structures and so on. And what it was particularly uh, a focus for us in the recent years is 
information about social interactions in, in the broader sense, which of course is very relevant for looking at single cell data, as I will also come back to later. But as you can see, many of our resources like ligand receptor information, extracellular information, or localization uh, include um, uh, many available uh, resources that teams have done. So great tools such as uh, CellphoneDB or, or Ramilowski for, for social interaction and, and many others. And all of this is available for you in one place that you can either, as I said, Bioconductor, Python, or Cytoscape reach. So once we have this um, knowledge, we try to use it, as I said, to extract mechanistical features. And I will focus today on transcriptomic. And the way we think about transcriptomic mostly for us, which is a group that focuses around signaling and regulatory process, is that transcriptomic is like the footprint of upstream processes. And uh, you know that there are many pathway methods, and those pathway methods, what they typically do is if you want to know if this pathway here is active, you will look at the transcripts that constitute this pathway. But the pathway is built of proteins, and whether there is more or less transcript doesn't mean that there is more protein necessarily. And also the activity of these proteins is regulated by, for example, localization or by um, uh, modification like a phosphorylation. So that's why we think this idea of the footprint is a much more meaningful one. And then what we did, and this was work of, of Michael Schubert, who actually now works with, with Maria when he was a PhD student with us, and then we have, we have expanded this, is to uh, create a large number of experiments where people stimulate cells, activate different pathways, and we use that to extract uh, specific signatures of the pathways that then we can use to go to samples of interest and extract estimation of pathways. So following the same idea of, of the footprint, but now looking at transcription factors, we also develop a resource called Dorothea that allows us to estimate transcription factor activity from gene expression. And here again, uh, we put a lot of emphasis on integrating a lot of resources from literature curated resources to chipsec, binary motifs, or purely data-driven uh, uh, transcription factor target uh, information, the so-called regulons. We have information for over uh, 1,500 transcription factors, and we did also a lot of benchmarks that I will not discuss, but they are in, in this publication here. And what really comes out is that there is a balance uh, uh, between coverage and accuracy. As, as you move through this wheel, if you like, you can increase the coverage, but you will lose accuracy. But again, here is, is, is this idea of having this resource to uh, infer a feature uh, from, from gene expression. And the last one along this line is a tool called Carnival that connects the pathways, the upstream uh, pathways from progeny with transcription factors by searching in a large signaling network that uh, we uh, build with Omnipath, although you could use other resources. It tries to identify causal paths that connects them and that explain how a particular ligand is able to activate uh, different pathways. So, I didn't get into details, but in, in our work, we have seen that these methods work on bulk RNA data, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it will go with single cell data, right? So we know single cell data has a number of unique features, uh, complications such as the low coverage and so on. So we really wanted to know before going with these methods ahead, do they really work well on single cell data? And for this reason, in a recent study that was spearheaded by Christian Holland, a PhD student in the lab, uh, we tried to, to, to develop benchmarks on single cell. And there were, and there are still maybe not so many data sets we can use because to benchmark whether these methods work, we need to have positive controls, for example, knock down a transcription factor and see if when you estimate its activity, uh, it corresponds to what you know have been done in the experiment. So because we didn't have so many of these, what we need is to take the data on bulk and to simulate as well as we could, the features of, of single cell data such as the droplets. And then we ran on this simulated data, uh, our tools as well as other more standard tools, uh, and then we try to see how well they perform. So the first thing that we, we found is that if you try to see the effect of, of loss of gene coverage on these methods, uh, of course there is an effect, but the, the transcription factor estimation with Dorothea and the pathway estimation with progeny they are reasonably robust. So here you can see how the performance, they are in the, the rock curve, decreases with the coverage, uh, but even by, by 500 genes, you are still at least above 
the 0.5, which will be random prediction. So we're able to capture some signal. Progeny is uh, uh, even more robust, so you can see that remains over 0.6, even though as you go down to 500 genes. But actually, if you look at um, other methods, like a classic Joe gene center, go gene center analysis, it drops and it drops faster, so that by 500 genes, you are pretty much on, on, at the random level. So this means that these methods tend to be robust because yeah, you are combining effectively many genes to get the signal and this helps to, to extract the signal. Then we took some of the existing uh, actually real data on single cells with perturbations. As I said there is not much, but there is some. So for example, we took a study with perturbsic and we look at transcription factors and, and, and then we see that with this resource, the Rothea, uh, we get uh, uh, a the curve of 0.7. Uh, again, here, if you add those regulators that regular regulons that, as I said, have more coverage but less curation, you have a certain drop in performance. Uh, and if you compare with other methods like Scenic or EUCEL, which is the algorithm with Scenic or, or MetaViper, which actually are supposed to be specific for single cell data, they, in our um, hands, in our benchmark, uh, they perform worse than using Dorothea. With the more classic Viper algorithm. And finally, to, to try to look at this from a more uh, um, point of view of the actual use of this data. So, we took a look at, at some nice data from Holger Schein group, where, where the benchmark are many different single cell technologies, some blood cells, some PPMCs. Uh, and in this study, they have annotated these cells by, by the cell type. And, and so, what we said is okay, can we? look at this data and are we going to able to extract the, the clusters of the different cell types uh, using our methods. So for doing this, we look uh, um, uh, at the silhouette width of the cluster. So this is a metric of how well cells cluster. As a kind of a reference, we took the 2000 highest variable genes and observed. So this is that performance. If we now take only 113 transcription factors, uh, you see that you are worse, but uh, not too far. This is again Dorothea, and as, as in the previous case, if instead you use a cell from Scenic or MetaViper, you do a bit worse. And to have further controls, we took the 113 most vari high variable genes. If you like a positive control, uh, this is uh, comparable, a bit worse perhaps, but comparable to our transcription factors. Uh, uh, and as negative control random genes with that, that perform much worse. And if you look at the expression of these actually 113 transcription factors, it's really much worse. And I'm going to show you that uh, uh, on, on a Yuma plot. So here is how the cell lines uh, uh, of the cell story look like annotated with you look when you look at the expression of the transcription factor. But instead, if you look at the activity estimated from those transcription factors, you see a much cleaner separation. So of course, this is not like a, a ground uh, proof, but it really suggests that, you know, if you look at transcription factors, which of course we know are very important for lineage and many other aspects, it makes sense to look at their activity. So not their own expression, because if they are expressed, it could still be that they are not functional because maybe they are not in the nucleus or they are not active. So rather use the activity of the transcription factors. And I think I will not show you this, but the path with activities from this progeny tool also capture the this cell type information in a similar manner, although slightly worse. So then what I'm trying to convey with these slides is that uh, um, we really believe these footprint signatures are really helpful uh, in general. So the idea that you want to measure something that is hard to measure, at least a high throughput, let's say the activity of transcription factor. So, but instead you can use indirect information such as the expression of the targetings. And as long as you have these causal links, as long as you know which transcription factor control which gene, you can use these methods. And as we have seen, this, they are reasonably robust uh, against features of single cells such as not having all the genes because you still have some to get some signal. And today is all about single cells, but I just wanted to mention also that this idea can be applied to other omics data, for example, phosphoproteomic, metabolomic, uh, um, that may or may not be single cell, but the, the similarity is hope. So with this then, uh, uh, we are convinced, and that's what we are doing in, in different projects, that we can use these strategies to estimate the activity of 
pathways, transcription factors, and other processes in individual cells. If you have enough coverage, work with the actual individual cell. If, if you don't have enough, perhaps you want to group them together in cluster and do some pseudo bulking. But you know, with these benchmarks, we have a good handle on, on how well those things could work. And this is looking at intracellular processes. But of course, one of the exciting things with single cells is that we can look at intercellular processes. And um, uh, this is also something we, we are working on. So you, for a given cell type, you could look at the pathway activity, prescription factor activity, connecting with Carnival, or, or you could use other great tools such as NicheNet or CellPhoneDB to look at ligand receptor interactions. And what we think is neat is that thanks to Omnipath, you have all this knowledge in one place. So it's really easy. And we have uh, workflows and, and, and code that we are also happy to share, whereby we can really do all these type of analysis from one place. So, um, so I've been talking now about um, um, cell cell interactions and, and how we can study them. And, and of course, where this is particularly exciting is if we can look at the spatial context. So we can study interactions in, in, in single cells in suspension, but if this comes from a tissue, we are losing a lot of information. And, and I guess in, in this uh, um, community, uh, you, we are all very well aware of that and also of the fact that uh, uh, these are great times for looking at this because new technologies are providing and spatially resolved highly multiplex RNAs, also other proteins such as proteins or sorry, other molecules such as proteins or metabolites. So, so we've been also starting to think how we can uh, move in this direction, always uh, focusing on this question of cellular interaction and cellular signaling. And, and thinking about it, there's a good number of uh, challenges that we need to address, I think, as a community. And, and I will just share some thoughts and some of our um, work on this, but really think it's something we should all work together and there is a lot to do and we can collaborate on. So one aspect to, to keep in mind is that these different special gene expression technologies, there are many, as I said, and they all have pros and cons, but in general, you either have a limited coverage of the genes or, or both, or a limited resolution, right? So some technologies like the FNX vision that I will show you in a moment, we, we don't really have single cell resolution, so we have groups of cells. So for that, a variant is to include other data, which is actually single cell, like single cell RNA seq, of course, but maybe also single cell attack seq. And, and the question is how we can use this data and as much as we can prior knowledge to, to, to improve our understanding of the biological processes. So one broad area that we, we are considering is, is how you get increased resolution from this spatial data that, as I said, may not have a very good resolution. And here, there is a lot of uh, work uh, towards understanding better the cell type composition or uh, trying to get more mechanistic insights. And a second broad area that we are interested in is, can we really learn about the actual tissue architecture? So can we study tissue patterns on space and can we use this to go toward maps of cell in a special context? So we don't work directly on methods for cell type composition. Of course, we use them. It's a very important topic, but there are great works working on that. But we felt we could leverage some of our expertise that I just presented before on pathways and prescription factor in the context. And to, to illustrate a bit of our work in this area, let me introduce your case study. Uh, this is work done by Ricardo Ramirez, Ivan Taneski, and Monica Hanani in, in the lab, together with Christoph Kupp and Raphael Kamen's lab in Aachen. Actually, Monica is a share student within our groups. And we also work with Chile and Ivan Costa lab in Aachen uh, on the bioinformatics, on the ataxic part that I will not discuss today. Um, and so Milding in Bad Onhausen is the one who provided uh, very exciting samples. So these are heart patients. Um, so we were very interested in looking at a, a human heart infarct. So we have a tissue from healthy heart, a myocardial infarction, and also people with chronic heart disease. And we were able to obtain samples at different places. So the ischemic zone, which is really where we're, the tissue is damaged, a more border zone, and a remote zone, which is supposed to be healthy, or at least looks normal. And then in the case of fibrosis, fibrotic tissue, right? So, so for, and then for, in this uh, context, we have special gene expression data from tenex visium and single cell RNA and ataxic. So then if you look at, at this, uh, some of the samples, and, and you simply try to, to 
for clustering, so you really see uh, interesting patterns on, on gene expression happening. And then we thought, okay, why don't we apply our tools? And indeed, you can do this, right? So you can say, okay, now we look at each spot. Uh, I would use this method that we have shown earlier that they are reasonably robust, even the coverage is not great. And I can estimate transcription factors and pathways, for example, TGF beta, which is very important in fibrosis. And then you see interesting patterns or, or the activity of transcription factors, right? And, and, and then we can look a bit more at uh, some of the targetings of the transcription factors and look in data. So we can use these tools to, to get some insight and to relate it to other information, such as, for example, the cell types in, in these different locations. Um, okay, that, that uh, makes sense. And now into some more detail toward the tissue architecture. And in particular, uh, can we really learn uh, about the special patterns that we see in this data? And here again, I, I like to distinguish two types of, of questions. So the first one is uh, if we take genes or transcription factor or other features, can we see if there are uh, of those individual features in interesting patterns? And we are doing this uh, using tools such as Spark or Spatial D that uh, other groups develop that are use, uh, good for that. But then we decided to also invest a bit uh, in, in a second question, which is can we um, understand better interactions at the intercellular level? And in particular, can we model explicitly those interactions in different spatial contexts? And for this, we develop a framework called MISTI to really dissect intercellular interactions. And the idea is to use a multi-view machine learning uh, framework uh, to do so. And uh, this builds some previous work uh, together with Oli Stegle uh, with a method called spatial variance component analysis. And, and uh, building on that, uh, we, we develop a flexible framework that allows us to look at, at different markers uh, and, and build different views. So for example, I would like to maybe distinguish between intrinsic processes inside the cell, uh, the near direct neighbors, uh, what we call the juxta view, the local view, a broader tissue view, what we call the para view, like when you think of paracrine signaling, and really anything that, that you're interested in. And, and from this, we derive different outputs. I will come to that in a moment that, that we try to, to, to use to understand what's going on. And I like to emphasize the fact that we think of MISTI as a flexible framework. So as I said, uh, there are some views, but you can really build uh, uh, views to address specific questions of, of interest. Uh, and of course, uh, I will talk now about RNA, but it, it can be applied and we apply to other type of multiplex data such as, as proteins. And by the way, the tool is, is available on our GitHub and also a manuscript describing it on Biochem. But so what are the three main questions that we try to address with MISTI? So one is how much can the context, the intercellular spatial context explain expression in contrast to the intracellular. The second is how much do different view components that I just introduced contribute to explaining that. And even more detail, what are the specific relations that can explain those contributions? So here's an example, we'll go back to the heart study. And then uh, in a particular uh, um, uh, sample, we wanted to see what feature in this place explain the expression of markers specific to a certain area. So for example, here we have a cluster of uh, uh, VSMCs, nuclear cells, or we have another area of uh, ischemic zone. And, and, and to answer this, we, we build uh, a simple model just to views, the intrinsic view, the cluster of inside, so inside the, the markers inside the cluster, and the para views, which we focus on understanding the role of cytokines. And then you can look at uh, uh, which um, of these views, the intrinsic versus the, the para view, the cytokines, is uh, contributing to explaining the variation in the data. So I should say that this is uh, not per se a causal effect, right? So we only try to explain the data in the sense of, of, of uh, if you like, correlation. So it's not yet causal, but at least hints to what could be happening. But we are able to see how much specific genes uh, 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 are affected by these different views. And we can do this in a more focused manner. So we can look at specific zones. And for example, if we focus on the ischemic zone, we see that uh, these two genes are, are, are very um, uh, important in, in explaining the changes across the different genes in this ischemic zone that I presented before. And this is shown here again in some more detail. So these are these two markers I just said that are important for the ischemic zone. These are two others that are important 
uh, in, the, in the smooth muscular cells, and this is the actual distribution of the expression of themselves. But this is then the distribution of this effect, so kind of a compound effect of, of, of importance and the level of, of these genes, and then we can see how this roughly corresponds to, to the distribution of, of these cells. Yeah, so with that, uh, I'd like to finish showing you some of our work. And as I said, uh, and this is largely ongoing, so I'm also happy to, to discuss more and, and to share some of this work. But also, as I said earlier, I, I really feel that uh, there is a lot of exciting challenges, a lot of, of things that we have to tackle, and in particular with single cell and special data. And uh, I, I would like to, to put forward a, a context, a framework where we can address challenges. And this is by crowdsourcing them. Uh, um, and the idea here is that if there is important challenge, I would not try to solve it by myself, but I will make it public uh, so that others can participate. And I think this can suit this type of problems we are addressing, because with these strategies, we can have an unbiased assessment of the methods. The idea is you put some training data in the public domain, and you ask people to predict some test data. And this we have applied in the context of something that's called the dream challenges. There are other initiatives uh, in biology, also like CAST for protein structure, for example, or there are commercial uh, variants of this, like, like Kaggle, that many of you probably know. But so we, in DREAM, we have tried to look at many questions relevant of biomedicine. And, uh, um, and yeah, we think it's quite relevant in, in this context. And actually, we have already done a few challenges. So one on prediction the, of the location of, of cells from single cell transcriptomic data uh, with Nikolaus Wajewski, the prediction of single cell proteins in breast cancer together with Bernd Bodenmiller, and with the Allen Institute, uh, uh, one that is very recent on, on cell lineage reconstruction. And I really will be helpful or thankful if any of you has ideas or data for challenge. Yeah, with that, I'll finish. Uh, uh, I think we're well in time. So I would really like to thank uh, our lab. So much of the work I presented today is from Christian Holland, who did the benchmark. Dennis leads the development of, of, of Omnipath. And this is also together with Tamas Shamaro's lab. Uh, Jovan is the main developer of MISTI, to, together uh, uh, with support from Rico and Attila. Rico also did a lot of the work on the heart that I saw you. And, and, and Monica, who is a young student with Rafael Kaman, and, and also Julian was involved in related projects. And yeah, we work a lot with other groups, in particular in this context with Oli Stegle. Holgar provides the data for, for the benchmark. And yeah, Professor Milting gave us uh, samples. And I just finished with some uh, summary of what I was trying to, to convey today. So we really think that biological knowledge helps to in, in dealing with single cell data. It improves performance and interpretability. Uh, it's robust to some of the features of single cell data. And we really recommend to think of RNA as a footprint, as a downstream of something that happens in the cell. I really believe benchmarking methods is critical. The field moves very fast, but we really need to make sure that what we see is what we think, or at least to have a good uh, uh, confidence that that's real, what we see. Uh, I introduced Omnipath, which is you no know, rocket science, but we think it's a useful one-stop shop for biological knowledge for single cell data. And the last part, I discuss some challenges and some ongoing work on special transcriptomic data, uh, and how, uh, in particular, this multi-view models from MISTI can be maybe a useful way to, way to extract intercellular interactions. Um, with that, uh, I finish. I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to discuss any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julio, for a wonderful talk. It's now time for questions. Um, you can raise your hand. OK, and I will try to unmute you. I hope it works. So the first question is from Carla Pairo Millet. I will unmute you. and. I hope it works. You should be unmuted now. You can ask your question. No? Carla? Okay, we try with the next person then. I don't know what happened there. Um, Holger Kirsten has a question. That should work. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. 
I uh, um, thank you very much for the really uh, enlightening talk. Um, could you uh, uh, relate your approach to the things that is done with ingenuity pathway analysis? There is a certain overlap to my field. Could you just comment on this? Yeah, indeed, conceptually they are very similar. Uh, I think it's better if you mute. Yeah. Um, um, uh, I would say that the main difference is ours is all open, so it's all transparent. You know where we get things from. You know our algorithms. You can check them. Uh, and I think this is important. Uh, uh, I mean, I have no specific problem or critic with the UT pathway. But in our hands, it's really important to understand the details and, and to, for example, you know, how are you doing significance? What is your null model? All these things are important. And when you do these tools, everything is open. So that's the main difference. Uh, but indeed, uh, these are tools that are really useful. Yeah. And it's free, I guess, our stuff. And did, 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 and did you do the benchmarking of both approaches? So I would be happy to, but uh, we will need to convince them to share with us uh, um, their stuff. Uh, uh, or um, I would be happy to, if you have access, we can run them in parallel. Uh, and, but no, we, we couldn't do it, right? We don't have the license. Good. Thanks. While we wait for more hands, ah, Fabian has a question. I also have one. But... Hey, Julio, that, 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 was, that was really nice. I was wondering about the um, MISTI, the interactions that, that you learned there that you want, want to find. This is now not based only on receptor ligand interactions, right? But this is also focusing on proximity of cells and also of potentially like diffuse. So, that this, for example, I mean, your delta nausea need to be touching, for other ones, there could be some diffusion gradient and so on. So, what exactly is being used and how do you do that? I kind of missed that part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, I was uh, very brief. So indeed, it's a combination of those things. And at the end, in the in the simplest way, for example, you would only say, in a data-driven way, what is the the kind of the, the correlation, or how well can I predict something from the neighbors? And maybe I can weigh uh, by by the distance. I can put a limit, or I can say, you know, kind of the effect will be diminished with the square of the distance. And this is not using biological knowledge yet. As you were pointing at, uh, this will be pure database, uh, data driven. But indeed, what we are working now is how we can use biological knowledge to improve this. As you said, ligand receptor, maybe model the diffusion. I mean, the diffusion in a way we, we kind of model it. If in our views we include uh, a function of the distance, uh, but I think there is more a lot to do, and that's really exciting for us how we bring into these uh, biological mechanisms. Yeah. And this works uh, for for the. Sort of not single cell resolved visium data as well, where you know you always have like a mixture of ten cells or something like that. Or would you maybe preferably do this for protein expression data, where you actually have real single cells? Yeah, indeed, in the protein, of course, it's cleaner in the sense that yeah, you are looking at single cells. In the in the visium, you can run it, and then your unit is 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 the spot that, as you said, is a mixture of cells. Then you have to be careful when you interpret the results. Uh, because it will simply tell you, you know, this spot depends on what's happening in that spot, but doesn't mean that this individual cell. And again, you could think of combining this with uh, uh, methods that try to use maybe single cell RNA data to kind of uh, deconvolute the cells in a specific spot. And we are trying to think a bit about this, but I, I think that's also a very interesting part of the area. Yeah. Yeah, that's I think interesting. I mean, there have been some approaches that do it, but then they, you do it step by step, but potentially actually doing it at the same time that might improve that, right? It's very interesting. Yeah, it would be nice to discuss more. Yeah, yeah. Um, wait, there is a question. Uh, just a minute. Ah, if there is a recording, okay, no. So then I, I would want to ask you a question which is kind of related to what Fabian was asking. Um, <clears throat> so obviously this is great if you have the spatial transcriptomics data. I love this, this beautiful plot where you had like the density of the, the kind of the relevance of the different genes depending on the position where they were. I was wondering if you only have the single cell data without the spatial information, to what extent you can also still um, um, use your tool to know what genes are actually the most relevant, not the most expressed, but the most relevant in the different, um, in this case would be the different cell types or in the interaction between them? Um, I mean, you mean having single cell, but no spatial resolution? 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, there, um, I guess we haven't analyzed that uh, uh, in that way. So I, I'm going to think loud now a bit how you would do it. I think it's a good question. So I guess, indeed, you could try to run basically what I described in the first part of the talk and, and more social interaction analysis. And uh, it would be interesting then to kind of try to uh, look at that by itself, but then trying to use the special information to try to assign those things to specific locations. Maybe you, you are mm -hmm. thinking also along those lines. But we really haven't done that yet. But I think, yeah, um, there is a lot to be gained by combining both data modalities uh, and, and mm -hmm. going between kind of from one, if you like, uh, space to the other. Yeah. But that's, uh, yeah. we haven't done that yet. Okay, thanks. And then I, I have another question, but I'm waiting. Raise your hands if someone else has a question. Um, you tested your, um, <clears throat> this was on the other project, I forgot the name, Dorothea, I think it was. No, the other one, the pathway uh, reconstruction. Um, project. Kind of gene network reconstruction analysis that you compared to scenic and to, to other single cell yeah. um, You used the simulated data. And to me, this is also something that you could put on one of your dream challenges. How does one best simulate data for single cell? So in our experience, whenever we have used simulated data, we have tried to simulate data for single cells. We find it to behave very differently from the real single cell data that we test afterwards. And actually, for example, for the pathway reconstruction, there was a Nature Methods published recently where they used both simulated data and real data, and they tested like a lot of different single cell gene regulatory network reconstruction methods. And yeah. they saw that the ones that performed for simulated data kind of did not perform for real data and the other way around. How do we solve that? How did you simulate the data? What are your ideas on that? I think it's also an area where there is a lot more to be done. I, I agree. I mean, our simulations were very simple here. Uh, we simply try to mimic, uh, uh, yeah, dropouts and, and other features from from what we knew from estimations. But but anyway, that, but that does not it's not about simulating the gene regulatory network. So I think you mentioned dream challenge that would fit very well for a dream challenge, uh, um, and I would be happy to do that if, if people are willing to be involved. And um, yeah, there are a couple of methods. The one you mentioned is called Beehive, I think, and I know another one. Uh, similar, but uh, I think it, there is always this tension, right? So the in silico data is great because you know the ground truth, but it's very hard. It's never going to be like the real data. It's never going to capture everything. And that's why I think trying to combine both, that's also what we try here. So do something in silico, do something on real data. And also in the dream challenge, very often we do that. Uh, it's, it's a good way to try to counterbalance. But yeah, this is a, a, a very important area, I agree. Because I really think, as I said, no, benchmarking the methods is very important as, as we move along exactly. as a community. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Fully agree. Good. So if there are no more questions, we will finish here. We thanks again, uh, Julio. It was a great talk. And we hope to see you all in two weeks uh, with John Marioni on the 17th of July. And bye-bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.